to present today uh, my work with uh, some of my students and our postdoc, Julian Kölbel. Uh, so last week we had Oliver Hart here, a Nobel Prize winner. So I'm taking on quite a difficult legacy, but I hope to entertain you for the next 40 minutes. And hopefully I can shorten a little bit the time until we get the final results by the presidential, from the presidential election in the US, which definitely will have a big impact on climate change. So today I'm going to present the work that I've done with uh, our postdoc Julian Kölbel and two of my PhD students, Jordi and Jen. Uh, and it's about how regulatory disclosure of transition and physical climate risk affect the credit risk of companies measured by the impact on the CDS term structure. And I want to mention as well that uh, a lot of this work has profited a lot, or I have profited a lot from uh, uh, my stay at Google as a visiting researcher. And I, I, I'm thankful for um, all the interaction I had with the NLP researchers uh, at Google. So uh, climate risk is basically consisting of two parts. Uh, one part consists of physical risk and physical risk can be very easily um, uh, illustrated by looking at the headquarters of Facebook in Silicon Valley. And as projected by the worst case scenario by the IPCC in, 2000, in 2100, the headquarters will be underwater. And this definitely has a big impact on uh, companies on the profitability of companies and therefore also on the credit worthiness of these companies. So physical, the physical aspect of climate risk, whether it's sea level rise or whether it's uh, impact through hazards, uh, natural disasters and so on and so forth is definitely a important component. The next important component is transition risk. We are all aware now that climate change is real and there will be some regulatory changes ahead of us that will change a little bit the way how companies have to adapt to climate change. And one way to force companies to take climate change into account and the risks of climate change into account is to impose taxes and uh, this again will have a big impact on how uh, the uh, profitability of companies will be in the future. And there is, of course, kind of a balance act that needs to be done by the regulators. So you need to account for the externalities that companies are, are uh, generating. And at the same time, you need to have a economy that is still functional. So for that reason, it is of utmost importance that uh, companies disclose their climate risk exposure in a transparent way. And for that reason, the Financial Stability Board in 2015 was founding the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which is chaired by Michael Bloomberg, and I quote him in 2015, he said that without effective disclosure of these climate risks, the financial impacts of climate change may not be correctly priced. And as the costs eventually become clearer, the potential for rapid adjustments could have a destabilizing effect on markets. So therefore, Disclosure of these risks is a key element for financial markets to work efficiently. There are two ways that you can disclose climate risks. One way is the voluntary way. So the TCFD has formulated uh, uh, common standards uh, that companies should follow in order to disclose their climate risk exposure to um, the investors and to the public. But one problem with this disclosure is that it is voluntary and 
companies can basically write in these reports whatever they want. Uh, so it's not legally enforceable, the information that they post there. And just as an anecdote, um, just recently Morgan Stanley uh, published their inaugural TCFD report and about 10 pages of the 36 page report were just pictures. Um, so full page photographs and there was actually no disclosure on carbon related assets. So that for that reason, these voluntary reports as we argue, provide only a limited amount of information that can be used to assess the true underlying uh, climate exposure from uh, uh, the firms. Another way to go is to look at the SEC's 10K filings. So the key advantage of this approach is that it's mandatory and a failure to disclose these risks may result in litigation. So for example, Exxon, uh, Exxon Mobil, uh, this American multinational gas and oil company was sued in, in New York's, by, by New York's attorney general for misleading investors by not complying to uh, the reporting uh, uh, guidelines by the regulators and that they were downplaying the risks that climate change would have on its business. So as a result, you could argue as an investor that you can be sure that climate risk information that is provided in these reports are reasonably informative. However, there's also a drawback with this uh, climate risk um, disclosure in these regulatory reports. It is, it is often said that the climate risk um, disclosure in these reports is pure boilerplate language. Uh, you can imagine that these reports are written by lawyers and they are read again over and over again by lawyers so that uh, they provide the minimal amount of information while just fulfilling the requirements by the regulators. And for that reason, you might argue that there is no information in these 10K filings. However, we thought that it might be an interesting um, research project to look whether we can dig out some information from these reports. And this is what we have done. So just in a nutshell, we observe that companies are exposed to physical and transition risks. These risks are completely different, I would say, because the physical risk is what nature imposes on us, whereas transition risk is basically a endogenous risk. It's the risk that we as a regulator um, uh, can impose on the economy. So it's man-made in that sense, or more directly man-made than the physical risk of uh, climate change. So we have these two risks. Obviously, there is a need for uh, climate risk disclosure for a efficiently working uh, financial market. Um, and there are two ways to disclose your risk, voluntary and risk as risk reporting as required by the regulators. So the research question we were posing ourselves was, can we find a method from natural language processing that allows us to extract information with regards to these two types of risk, physical and transition risk. The second research question was, can we gain relevant information from these SEC 10K filings, which are often uh, labeled as pure boilerplate? And then the third question, which is, which is of course important, uh, also from the quote by, by, by Michael Bloomberg, is does climate change disclosure has an, have an impact uh, on prices in financial markets? And we choose CDS prices. And I'm going to motivate a little bit later why we were choosing uh, prices of credit default swaps and not something else. And just to uh, present as well the contributions that we have, so you do not have to wait until the end. 
of the presentation. So what we did, we were fine tuning a uh, so-called context-based algorithm that can efficiently distinguish between the notion of physical and transition risk. Um, the second finding is that we can actually evaluate these 10K filings and we can find important information in these 10K filings, which usually keyword-based approaches that are employed in the finance literature all over the place um, are not enough. They are not complex enough in order to get this information out. And then third, transition risk disclosure has an impact on CDS prices. It increases CDS prices, whereas physical risk disclosure decreases CDS prices. Now you might think that this is kind of a strange result because in one case, uh, disclosure increases the price and in the other case, the disclosure decreases the price. And we wanted to give some theoretical arguments that can justify this kind of finding. And this is what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna skip the slide on related literature as I mentioned already, there are a couple of uh, approaches that use different uh, proxies for climate risk exposure. And I will come back to these proxies when we talk about the robustness analysis for our paper. So first, a little bit of theory. Well, in finance, you can basically, so empirical finance is probably a little bit too contaminated by approaches that make some kind of hypothesis and then they do a regression analysis and then they find some relation, statistical relation, but you do not often think about the causality that might be the mechanism behind these findings. And we wanted to avoid this kind of trap and we wanted to think a little bit deeper about what theory can actually tell us about how the disclosure of risk can impact and should impact prices. So you were asking, what does finance theory tell us about the effect of risk disclosure on CDS spreads? And here, disclosure is an important word. So we are not looking at directly what the impact of risk should be, but the risk disclosure. And that's a subtle difference because you can think of two effects. One effect, so if you are an investor and you learn more about the risk exposure of a certain company, then you can be surprised by this risk disclosure. And you can argue, well, if this company has more risk exposure, then I command a higher risk premium. This is the so-called risk perception effect. So the Closure gives the, inform, uh, gives the investor an information about a additional risk component, which he has not thought of before. And that would then increase the CDS spread because the CDS spread is like an insurance contract on the, uh, on the survival of the company. But then there is also another effect. So if you are an investor and you know that company A is exposed to some risk and then company A gives you a clearer signal about the true underlying risk, you could argue that this has a information uncertainty effect. And the information uncertainty effect is related to the fact that we as investors are uncertainty averse well, that's an assumption, but that's usually the case. And the disclosure gives us a clearer signal about the underlying risk. So in that sense, the uncertainty risk premia that is attached to the CDS spread is diminished. And the reason why uh, we look at CDS spreads is probably for two reasons. So you could also argue that you could look at corporate bond spreads. So the first reason why to look at CDS spreads is that CDS contract is typically traded in standardized terms, whereas bond spreads are more likely to be affected by the differences in some contractual agreements. And they're also likely to be contaminated by liquidity effects. 
And the second, uh, second important aspect is it was shown in literature that uh, CDS spreads, they tend to react more quickly to new information, whereas bond spreads are a little bit more uh, slower in, in reacting. And lastly, there is also the problem that when you look at corporate bond yield spreads, then you must also specify a benchmark interest rate. And uh, this can then be contaminated by non-default components. So therefore, CDS spreads are really a clear measure that allow you to look at the credit worthiness of a company in, in a very clear and sober way. So I'm gonna be very brief on the theoretical part. So I provided already a little bit the, the uh, intuition behind uh, these theoretical concepts, but you can think of the classical Merton model. So the classical Merton model tells you that the firm's equity is something like a European call option on the asset value A. And this asset value A follows some geometric Brownian motion under some reference measure P. Then uh, default can only happen at maturity. You can derive the price of a credit spread. And then you can also introduce jump risk. So the um, firm, uh, the asset value is not only following a smooth, diff not smooth, but a diffusion process, but can also exhibit some, some jumps. And then you could argue that the risk perception effect can be summarized actually in, in two different ways to think about it. The first uh, way would to think about it would be to argue that if the risk is captured by more intense and severe downward jumps in the asset value due, due to hazards and other physical climate risks, this would impact your credit spreads. And of course, if you increase the jump or the expected jump size, then the uh, credit spread would become more positive, uh, would become larger. You could also argue that the frequency of natural disasters would increase and that would also lead to a uh, increase in, in the credit spreads. You could also argue that transition, you could also argue that a, when you observe transition risk, you would argue that the introduction, the smooth transition to an economy where you have um, taxes on emissions would be captured by a decrease in the firm's asset value. And this is the approach that is uh, followed by, for instance, uh, data provider Carbon Delta. They assume that the introduction of uh, carbon taxes would decrease the asset value. And then you would also find, of course, uh, that the credit spreads would increase. So if you look at um, some numerical example, how this would look, uh, when you add jumps, this would increase to the credit spread. So here would be the benchmark uh, uh, spread curve and an increase, a decrease, an increase in the jump sizes would of course lead to a increase in credit spreads for basically all maturities. So it has kind of a smooth, uh, an equal effect on different maturities where maturities go here from uh, zero or one year to 30 years. On the left-hand side, you see the impact on uh, by decreasing asset values. It has a similar impact, but note the difference here that at very short maturities, a uh, decrease in asset value has almost no impact on the credit spread. And most of the impact is actually felt at medium maturities around five to 10 years. So already by looking qualitatively at these impacts from a theoretical viewpoint, you can probably argue that how uh, 
investors are taking into account the disclosure of uh, these risks if you find similar uh, behavior in the real data. Then there is also something like the information uncertainty effect, which I argued before. So as an investor, if you get uh, more risk disclosed, this could have an impact which would lead to decreasing credit spreads because the uh, signal, the noise for the signal is decreased. And this builds on the argument by Duffy and Lando who published a paper in 2001 in Econometrica and they build a model where they derive the credit spread curve in case the investor has only incomplete information about the true underlying value of the firm. So A star would be the true underlying value of the firm. And then you contaminate the true underlying value with some uh, Gaussian noise and you derive the uh, credit default curve accordingly. But you could also argue that when a company discloses the underlying risk, that could give you a clearer signal about the underlying jump risk. So climate risk could be captured by negative jumps uh, for the underlying asset value. And Liu and co-authors in review of financial studies, they study a general equilibrium model where you have imprecise knowledge about rare events and the representative investor is ambiguity averse. And then you can use the simple, not so simple, uh, but uh, machinery from uh, all this uncertainty aversion literature. And you can calculate uh, a set of measure changes that contaminate the underlying reference measure, and you can make uh, the analysis accordingly. So when you plot the impacts of these different approaches, you see that the Duffy-Lando effect, that is the effect that assumes that the underlying firm value can only be observed with some noise, has definitely an effect on the short end of the credit spread maturity curve. So longer spreads are almost or are no longer influenced by this uncertainty component. Whereas if you have uncertainty on the uh, jump values for uh, when you have a jump diffusion model, you see that the impact is much uh, smoother and should be felt across the whole term structure. And again, this information uncertainty has, of course, just the opposite effect uh, than the risk perception effect, the information uncertainty effect leads to a decrease of the underlying uh, credit spread curve. So given these theoretical considerations, uh, we started to formulate three hypotheses. And these three hypotheses are as follows. So first hypothesis is that, well, regulatory disclosure of climate risk has absolutely no effect on credit spreads because the 10K filings are just boilerplate. The other hypothesis that we, we would argue is that the regulatory disclosure of transition climate risks increases credit spreads. Why should that be a good hypothesis? Well, you could argue that like 10 years ago, nobody was really thinking about transition risk, that the, the, uh, the climate change will have soon a dramatic impact on, on the economy. We would argue that this, this uh, attention to climate risk came especially after the Paris Agreement in 2015, when there was a big hype about this uh, conference and about this, this agreement, which also entered the public debate on climate risk. And for that reason, companies had to fear that eventually governments will put forces together and introduce a 
tax system on emissions, which will hurt the profitability of the firms. So the awareness of transition risk was probably not always there. And therefore, if companies started over the last 10, 15 years, started to disclose transition risk, this was something, a new aspect of risk for the representative investors. And therefore, you could argue that the arrival of, or the potential arrival of transition risks would increase the credit spreads. On the other hand, um, physical risks have been around for centuries. There is a whole big industry, the reinsurance industry, that deals with this kind of physical risks. So the only thing that changes in terms of physical risk is that climate change will have an impact on the severity and the uh, intensity of the intensity and the, the frequency of natural disasters, but it's not a new risk. And therefore, you could argue that if you disclose your exposure to physical climate risk, this is nothing new for investors. An investor, especially in the CDS market, is a very well-educated investor. And it would therefore, you could therefore argue that disclosing physical climate risk would have a would sharpen the signal about the underlying risk and therefore lead to a decrease in credit spreads. So these are our hypotheses. Let me briefly, because time is really flying, uh, talk about the data. So we look at the period from 2010 to 2018. Uh, we take uh, CDS spreads from the usual suspect from Thomson Reuters, then when we analyze the CDS, um, when we do the regressions, we do control, of course, for uh, the usual variables that are taken into account by the uh, standard literature, Colin Dufresne and co-authors, Ericsson, Han, and Shu. And when we match all the CDS data with our uh, other data sources from uh, the 10K findings, we end up with about 447 different uh, companies that we can analyze in our regression. Then let me just briefly talk about uh, the sector classification. So for the sector classification, we rely on the SASB's materiality map. Materiality map uh, has about seven different categories which can be termed as relevant for climate and whenever uh, we have four out of seven issues that apply for uh, the sub industries that we are looking at so in total we are looking at about 77 different industries when we have four out of seven issues that apply for that given industry we label that industry as material industry. And we would argue that for these material industries, if we are able to measure uh, transitory uh, transition and physical risks from the 10K filings, that we would find some, some impact there. But this brings me, of course, to the problem of, well, how should we now measure uh, the transition risk and the physical risk from these 10K filings. And this is done by BERT. And BERT, BERT is our friend. Uh, BERT is a, a, a algorithm that was developed in, to, uh, in, in 2019 by researchers at Google. And since I think October, 2019, BERT is also part of the Google search engine. And therefore, when we Google something, then somewhere BERT is helping us in providing better results. And therefore we thought, well, why not use BERT and not use other more simpler models, keyword-based models. And of course, time is definitely not uh, available to explain you the whole machinery behind the BERT model. But it's probably the most important takeaway is that BERT is a contextual model. So it's not a 
model that is uh, based on, on keywords. It can interpret the context of a word and therefore it is much stronger than uh, other algorithms that were uh, used before. And also BERT provided uh, state-of-the-art results for, for many difficult NLP tasks. Um, then I asked myself, okay, uh, why you BERT? Uh, why should I use BERT and not some uh, simpler approach? And actually with uh, some of my colleagues from Google, uh, together with uh, uh, Massey, who is also in the, in the presentation today, we uh, looked at, we did a lot of experiments using different approaches. And also, we were also using BERT. And we looked at how BERT performs to other approaches, like keywords-based approaches and uh, approaches based uh, on, on naive Bayesian models. And it turns out that BERT, so this is BERT applied to different data sets. So we looked whether BERT can classify climate relevant text within Wikipedia, within 10K files, or within a set of uh, climate related claims. And we see that especially in terms of precision for 10K files, BERT is doing uh, quite a good job and outperforms other methods by a large margin. And especially precision is a very important key performance measure uh, when you want to apply uh, things like sentiment analysis and other, other things. Um, so, okay, BERT seems to be uh, a good candidate to implement for, for our task. So I said, okay, BERT, here is your task. Basically, we defined two tasks for our fine-tuned BERT. Um, the first task was BERT had to identify climate-relevant topics in uh, the 10K filings. We were explicitly looking just at one item in the 10K filings, item 1A. And this is something uh, which I should also mention uh, because it's another advantage of looking at the 10K filings, the item 1A is a section which must be explicitly about risk and it must be forward-looking. And this is all we want to have, right? Because CDS prices are also prices that incorporate future expectations. So they're also forward-looking. And item 1A is perfectly suited for that because it's like a labeled text already companies have to report the risk in a forward-looking way in item 1A. There is another item, item 7, which is management discussion. So companies can also talk about climate risk in this management discussion. And we used also the information from item 7, but we get not such a clear result for our analysis than we get when we just look at item 1A. So this is a very important uh, aspect to take into account. Um, and the second task, which is of course the most important for us, is that uh, the second task is, can BERT differentiate between physical and transition risks? So this is the TP task. Then we use the baseline model. The baseline model is basically uh, a keywords-based model, bag of words-based model with some <clears throat> random forest behind it that uh, allows us to do this benchmark analysis. And most importantly, or the most important takeaway from this uh, table is that uh, the baseline model, the keyword-based model fails miserably in terms of accuracy for the TP task. And this TP task, the differentiation between physical and transition risk is the most important one. And when we compare uh, with BERT, BERT already gets us a accuracy above uh, 90%. So BERT is obviously doing a very good job. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna present now the results. So the results are as follows. So there are a lot of uh, numbers. So let me just briefly 
make this a little bit more comfortable to, to analyze for you. So we looked at uh, this regression. Uh, so we regressed uh, uh, the spread, CDS spread on, on our control variables and then on the changes in physical, in the physical disclosure measure and the transition disclosure measure. And we find that for this material group, so the, again, these material groups are based on the sector classification of SASB. We see that we have, at least for the five-year maturity and the 10-year maturity and the 30-year maturity, although the 30-year maturity is definitely not uh, very liquid. So therefore these results have to be analyzed with a little bit of uh, cautious here, uh, but we see some, some impact. There's no impact by physical exposure, but this might have to do with the fact that the material group is very broadly defined. And I will show that when we are narrowing down the materiality group, then we see a much clearer picture for the impact of physical disclosure. I argued before that the transition risk might be might have become more important after the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement, these are basically the, the figures behind the Paris Agreement, had a big impact on the probability, like what companies were thinking about the probability that at some point governments will uh, ask for a emission tax. So therefore, we looked at the following exercise. We looked at a regression which differentiates between the period before and after the Paris Agreement 2015. And when we look again at the materiality group, we see that the impact after the introduction of, the, after the Paris Agreement becomes substantially higher for transition risk. So this means that given that the, the impact is positive, as you see here, so these are positive numbers. So this is a risk perception effect. It will increase the CDS spreads. So we have here a perfect example of how the awareness of transition risk after the Paris Agreement had a big impact on uh, CDS spreads. So I said that we can control for materiality for physical risks. Um, I don't want to go back to this SSB materiality map, but from the seven categories that deal with climate risk, there is one category that deals with physical climate risk. And when we group into our sample into companies that are exposed to this physical climate risk into one group and non-physical climate risk exposure in the other group, we see that the impact of physical risk disclosure becomes again super significant for all maturities and it becomes negative. So this means that the disclosure of physical risk had a information uncertainty effect. When you disclose physical risk, this means you give the investor who is uncertainty averse a clearer signal about the underlying risk. So when we summarize um, the impact here, so here on the left panel, you have uh, the impact of transition risk disclosure. And we looked at uh, one sigma and two sigma shift. So we found that transition risk has a after the Paris Agreement, a significant impact on the CDS spread curve by increasing the CDS spread. So this is the risk perception effect. And then when we look at the material group, we see that 
with very high statistical significance, you have a negative impact of physical risk disclosure on credit risk. Of course, you might argue it's not economically significant. So therefore we looked at the economic significance of our finding and we find that the one standard deviation increase in transition risk leads to an increase of almost 70 basis, basis points in the average five-year spreads for the post-Paris period. So this is a increase of 4.4%, which is definitely quite large and economically significant at the same time. Uh, one standard deviation of physical risks leads to a reduction of 4.6% in the five-year credit spread. So why five-year credit spread? Usually the five-year credit spread is the most liquid credit spread. And the third point, theoretical justification. Um, the, so what you see here is what we observe in terms of a one standard deviation shift and the two standard deviation shift for transition risk. And here a one standard deviation shift and a two standard deviation shift for, um, for physical risk. And the other curves that you see are the ones that we derive in our theoretical arguments so these are the curves that I showed you at the very beginning. And it seems that they align very well with uh, what we observe in the market without having estimated the model in a precise way. So we just did a regression analysis. So that would be definitely an interesting avenue for future research. And it seems to be aligned very well with our theoretical predictions that we had in terms of the risk perception effect and the information uncertainty effect. Of course, you could argue that, well, that's all very nice. Uh, you use a very complicated uh, model from computer science in order to do your natural language processing analysis, but is it actually robust to, uh, do you get the same results with easier and mo more simpler models? And therefore, I'm gonna introduce a couple of re robustness tests so there is a famous keyword-based approach uh, by Ceres and Cook ESG. These are uh, nonprofit organizations that provide uh, data to investors. And when we do the same analysis, we basically do not find anything that uh, is worth mentioning. Um, it doesn't seem to give uh, a clear impact. Uh, the arrival of the Paris Agreement does not give any significant result and there's only one significant result here meaning that you have some kind of information uncertainty effect if you believe that this is uh, climate risk is correctly measured by this cook esg measure which is also based on the 10k filing so they basically use the same uh, uh, data as we do but they just use a bag of words approach and therefore this simpler NLP method is not able to extract the information in a precise way from the 10K filings. Then I think two weeks ago, we had the guest here who was uh, talking about the firm level uh, climate risk exposure. And they use also a keywords based approach. And we thought that because they, are kind enough to provide the data for, for the public. Uh, they, um, when we do the analysis for, for our case, we do not find any consistent story that uh, translates our theoretical predictions into the empirical observations that you have. Sometimes they're even a little bit contradictory uh, to what we observe. They also, for instance, on this slide here, they also have the differentiation between transitory risk, which they call regulatory risk, and um, they also look at physical risk. And as you can see, let's say if you look at, for instance, the five-year maturity, um, you have a positive effect of regulatory risk on uh, five-year maturity. Let's see here. You have a negative effect for the whole period. 
So this seems to be a little bit in contradiction and it's probably a little bit hard to interpret the switch from a negative sign to a positive sign uh, with the arrival of the Paris Agreement. We also did some robustness checks uh, used based on uh, emissions that companies are voluntarily reporting. So there we also do not find a clear consistent effect. And also we do not find that the Paris Agreement had a considerable effect on, uh, on, on the CDS pricing when you proxy carbon, uh, when you proxy climate risk with uh, carbon emissions. So just to conclude, um, we basically introduced a novel metric, uh, which is uh, BERT based, uh, and it's based on mandatory disclosure. So we find that CDS spreads, which is a good proxy for, for the credit worthiness of companies, reacts to climate risk disclosure. It reacts differently to disclosure of transitory risks. Uh, transitory risks disclosure are driven by a risk perception effect. Physical risk disclosures are driven by a information effect. And also what we found that BERT really gives a consistent interpretation of these theoretical predictions that I mentioned. Uh, consistent with uh, our empirical observations, whereas uh, other keywords and even emissions-based approaches do not lend themselves to develop such a, a nice story. Then just to mention, um, NLP is a field which evolves quite rapidly. Uh, BERT is already considered as an old model. Uh, uh, so there will be newer models that might uh, even get better results in terms of analyzing text in terms of climate risk. Um, the, our next steps are we make this climate risk course publicly available upon publication of, uh, of the paper. Um, and we are also thinking about extending, or we are currently working on extending the algorithms for voluntary risk disclosures so that we can measure the quality of uh, voluntary risk disclosures along the TCFD guidelines. And then, of course, it would be interesting to estimate uh, a fully fledged structural credit risk model that takes all this. Uh, aspects or different risk disclosures into account, but this is definitely beyond uh, the current version of this paper. We didn't look at the correlation between physical and transition risk. Uh, given that they have a, a different impact on uh, the CDS spreads, I'm not sure whether they there would be an issue of uh, multicollinearity. Um, also, we, we take differences. So this is very important. Whenever you have uh, text-based studies in finance, you should uh, use a, you should take uh, uh, differences for your regressions because uh, these texts are, these texts are very sticky and do not change uh, a lot. So therefore there's a big literature that argues that you should take uh, these differences. Uh, yes, these are out of sample scores. I would have a quick question on the emission validation part. So, so you said basically um, that the emissions were not really related to, uh, they didn't really, like the amount of emissions that a firm actually has doesn't really have an effect or, or it's not really correlated or the amount that the firm discloses, for example, by SCBT. Um, so we used uh, the, the emissions that were voluntarily disclosed for this regression analysis. Um, maybe Jordi could elaborate a little bit more on what he tried uh, to find using uh, uh, this emissions data. Uh, 
Yeah, so basically for the emissions data, we also looked at the data stream, like the emission data that is available there. And we looked at different like measures, like we took the pure like amount, but we also looked at the amount, for example, like corrected for the sales data. So you have some kind of like relative measure. And then there was also like some, some scoring and that we also tried, but actually the ones showed here or like the one that was shown in the presentation, that was basically the one that gave the results that were like most um, resembling what we had. Like the other ones were even like even further away from what we find. Okay, because I was just thinking that like those databases that use the self-disclosed data of firms, there might be a correlation between the data the firms disclose themselves and uh, the way how they reply to the 10K prices. Is it? Because also when we look at this data, there is like a big loss in uh, observations because there is much less data available on that side. So we tried to be as fair as possible and, and presented the best results that we got for this emission analysis. And as uh, you already rightfully mentioned, uh, the sample decreased substantially for the emissions data. So we had to narrow down our analysis quite, quite a lot. It was scope one, two, and three, and revenue weighted, which gave the best results. We also uh, did many different analyses with just scope one, with just scope one and two, and and so on and so forth. But this was really the most uh, the clearest result that we got. It could be, it's a little bit tricky with uh, the data. So when we would include uh, Trump as a break point, then we are left with very little data uh, after, after November, 2016. Uh, so probably we run there into a problem. Could have had an impact. Um, so we did not yet look at that. So one way to go forward is to wait a little bit with that paper and then do the regression analysis again when we have more data available. Going forward, it would be interesting to see, and maybe we know tonight uh, whether we have another potential event that we can analyze academically uh, to see whether there is an effect uh, if Biden wins. But I think uh, the, the companies in the US, they have taken climate risk very seriously despite uh, who was uh, reigning in the White House. So yeah, one would have have to let data speak.